mean, not so much anymore. I did that more for like conferences and stuff. Yeah. Not a bunch. We always have to keep deviance a little bit concealed, otherwise. I get it, don't worry. Yeah. All right. Oh, <laughs> I'll get my little thingy. Um, so welcome to, to week three of Deviance and Normality One. Um, this week we move into, so we, we last week, we, um, or we introduced the class with the study of crime and deviance, then we moved into classical and positivist perspectives, um, so quite broad and wide ranging. Um, and then this week now we move into our first kind of discussion of substantive theories. Um, so here you'll see the themes are um, social disorganization, we'll see what that means as a concept, and um, a, another sort of theoretical perspective, um, and the Chicago School. Um, so you'll see, and you'll see a theme throughout this course, uh, but the titles of the theories that we use and the perspectives we use um, from this point forward, I know the classical school and positivism are a little bit more arcane and abstract, um, but from this point forward, the titles will really be full of a lot of hints. Um, so as we'll see, social disorganization um, sees in a very kind of Durkheimian way. Um, we'll see with the work of, of Robert Merton and other quote-unquote Chicago school theorists. Um, we, we will, not that he was necessarily one, but um, same line of thinking. Um, we'll see that social disorganization, uh, namely having institutions, um, norms, values, things so on in the institutional side, the education system, the economy, the opportunities we have to work, um, and on the norm side, our beliefs about kind of individualism, about success. Um, for social disorganization theorists, when our structures and our values are disorganized, um, that is when people may turn to crime and deviance. Um, so we'll see this as a big theme this week with Durkheim and next week with Robert Merton. Um, and the Chicago School is called that because roughly starting in like the 1910s and 20s, um, Durkheimian theorists, people kind of looking at uh, the impact of social structure on personality and our development and our behaviors and all of that, they were very interested in, in, one, in finding out um, why Chicago had the high levels of crime and deviance that it did. Um, and as we'll see, Chicago was a very interesting case study because for anyone that knows a little bit about it, it has tons of neighborhoods. Um, and the neighborhoods within it have very differing social norms, opportunity structures, and ergo, according to this theory, as one could expect, um, very different levels of crime. Um, so Chicago is still known as a city with, um, it often has the highest homicide rates um, in North America, um, and it's kind of globally on the map known for that as well. But as again, we'll see, we're not going to be super focused on Chicago, but more seeing, again, how um, that, those issues are not, you know, explainable by Lombrosian positivism of people necessarily being different um, in those areas, but opportunity structures and values kind of um, making crime seem more attractive um, and making deviation or deviance from the norm um, seem more intuitive and rational. Oops. Um, so you'll see so far, so the, the central question of this week is, again, we, we culminated, we uh, finished off last week with the claim that you know, if you kind of combine the classical school, again, just to recap, the classical school saw coming out of the Enlightenment, made by politicians, people like the founding fathers of America and whatever, um, and, and early Britain, the classical school saw 
all people as equal um, and all equal in terms of their capacity for thinking through their behaviors. Um, so if a lot of people were turning to crime and deviance, which they were in the early 1800s with new urbanization and industrialization going on, new settlements and so forth, if people were engaging in crime and deviance, then proponents of the classical school said, hey, we need to do some sort of social reform of our society because these otherwise good people are doing bad things. So we need to teach them that their behaviors are not actually good, um, that they're actually just doing short-term hedonistic kind of um, pleasure activities. And in the long term, these will be unpleasurable. So we need to teach them that. So remember, it advocated for social reform. Positivism, on the other hand, was kind of the emerging critique of that view, saying, are people all really the same, A? Um, so racists at the time thought, no, they're, they're not. Many people are quote unquote inferior and of different cloth and all of that. Um, so A, some people may be different. And then B, crime and the choice to deviate may be much more complicated than just someone saying, hey, um, I want you know, to be accepted by my peers or I want um, to have money and there's no jobs, so I'm going to turn to crime. Maybe people are turning to crime for other reasons, and maybe there are, as we'll see this week, structural things that necessitate crime. It's not necessarily someone sitting down and thinking, um, like a rational actor, you know, I want to get to point B, um, so route A is not available to me, so I need to take route D. Sometimes crime is much messier than that. Um, so, when we see that the, the criticisms of, of Lombrosian positivism as being kind of very reductionist um, and segregating people and classifying them, when we see that the criticisms of those, of that perspective, kind of led to the search for external sources of crime, that's, that's, we'll see this all happening this week, the influence of Durkheim, who we'll focus mostly on, kind of him winning and founding sociology as a real discipline, roughly in 1900. Um, our question will be, where did research efforts start to go? Um, so we'll kind of look at how Durkheim won that battle. Um, and then we will see the primary schools that came out of his work this week and next week. Um, this week we'll look, at, we'll look at social disorganization and the Chicago School. And then we'll see how that really culminated in a line of work that's still used today, um, strain theory from Robert Merton. So that'll be next week. Um, so, as I mentioned, the Bursic article that we, we read, for, so for those of you close readers, you'll see it was all full of like criticisms and all these principles and stuff. Um, we're not going to be getting into all of that, so that's why um, I said just to kind of read the Bursic article to supplement Tierney, um, who we'll be focusing on mostly today. Uh, but, but we'll end with Bursic as well, because I think he gives a very nice little kind of quick summary um, of social disorganization theory. Uh, to supplement this. Um, so to begin, we see we start this with, as I mentioned, the work of Emil Durkheim. Um, so Durkheim was very interested in this moment. He was reacting to um, kind of the long residues of the French Revolution in his native France, roughly 100 years before he wrote this. Um, he saw that you know, the, for anyone that knows the, anything about that revolution, um, he says that people's kind of rallying efforts for obtaining liberty um, or agency in sociological terms had left state of Fran the state of France in a kind of normative and moral and in many ways institutional chaos um, where people had been kind of vi violently um, uprooted from their traditions with the promise of living in you know, a very equal, rational life, um, but many people were resisting that, many people were not getting the sorts of intellectual fruits they had imagined, the jobs they had imagined, and so on and so forth. Um, so Durkheim's argument here was, and, and we'll see his, his central kind of, his impetus for writing and creating sociology um, was saying that, you know, it's all well and good to say that people can have, t have paramount agency and just do whatever they want and be free and rational, um, but we're conditioned by the structures around us. 
Um, and so even though there may have been many things about French aristocracy that were, you know, hierarchical um, and like a caste system and people had very limited rights from birth, whereas other people were born into hereditary wealth. Um, so even though all of those things had, you know, many negatives about them, people knew that as their culture and their tradition. So the French Revolution really shaked things up. And so now you have a bunch of people over several decades um, who may have developed new institutions through adapting to this new chaotic world that are not totally helpful. Um, so that we'll see, I'll, I'll play you a video after I'm done talking about Durkheim to kind of show his context. Um, another way of framing his central paradox and question that he studies is, you know, how is it that capitalism, which on paper kind of gives everyone equal opportunity, uh, you know, through meritocracy, how is it that, um, you know, even in, even him writing like almost 150 years ago in, um, you know, a much more homogenous society, mostly white, um, British, uh, when he's writing about Britain and France, how is it that even in those, in those times, um, this thing that's giving people equality on the surface also heightens people's misery um, and their capacity to just kind of overthink things and feel bad about their situations. Um, so we'll see here that he's very focused on people's pain um, and how people come to deviate or disagree with the norms around them. And he challenges the view that these sorts of feelings come, quote, from psychological or biological impulses. Um, so as we'll see, again, if you, the more you read of him, and even from introductory classes, um, he is someone who is very concerned in showing how our innermost states of being, so related to this course, our rational faculties, our decisions to, to disobey people, our decision, decisions to attack people, whatever it is, um, that even though much of that can come from ourselves, from our own kind of personality, um, they're highly based on um, the structures around us. Um, so ultimately, we'll see he sees crime as normal, as again, in the, in the kind of context I've been mapping out for you um, of, of France of his day, um, and even you know, the contemporary United States, as we'll see next week with Merton, um, he sees crime and deviance as normal because to him, it makes sense that people will not always totally align with their social structures. Uh, and that's a kind of jargony way of saying, we may not always believe um, in the things society tells us. We may not always believe in what our parents tell us, what our friends tell us, we may get frustrated. Um, and so he is one of the first people to really try to study that seriously and basically say, you know, what is it about life in societies that may lead um, some societies to have lower rates of crime and deviance? So in his view, what is it that makes people happier in some societies? What, what is it that makes people more integrated? Um, so you'll see this is a hugely influential kind of turn um, from the big broad discussions of, again, the classical school, talking about people's rational choices, and the positive school, kind of talking about how people are pushed. Here, was, for the first time again, Durkheim really blends these um, by saying, yes, of course, people make their own choices, but they do so in contexts that they don't choose. Um, maybe some of that is our biology and psychology, but most of what he's interested in um, is social patterns. Yep. Um, so at the bottom it says um, he thinks crime is potentially dysfunctional, but in the reading, didn't he say crime had a function? Yeah, that's why it's potentially dysfunctional. So crime, so the function, uh, we'll get to that soon. So the function of crime, we'll see um, crimes can help. I think I have it. Um, where do I put it? Anyway, I'll show it later with, or with organic. Um, but crime is normal because the, for the main reason, it allows people to express frustrations with the status quo. So if there are norms and laws that don't work, people will resist. So even like the French Revolution, um, that's criminal but normal. He gives the example of Socrates um, as being uh, penalized by, you know, sent given death sentences and all these things uh, from his Greek society of the time. Um, but ultimately as being functional for uh, providing this way of innovating and showing people that you know, uh, your way of evaluating ideas isn't fair. Um, so dysfunctional crime can happen though if, we'll see this with the study of suicide, if people start turning to crime and deviance en masse. Um, so that's what prompted the work in the Chicago school, because again, they saw this city as kind of deteriorating, people turning against social institutions, 
Um, you know, think of mass looting. I talked about the crime panic in the 1700s Britain. Um, he's saying crime is normal as a whole, uh, but when you have you know, extremely high levels of it, then it can be dysfunctional. Again, his metaphor we'll see, seeing society as a body, um, if, if, the, if the system starts rejecting its organs um, and, and killing itself, uh, then that can destroy a society. Um, so like in a tyranny, when everyone turns against the leaders, um, think of the fall of communism in certain countries, he would say that, that you know, leads to dysfunctional crime where people overthrow the state. Um, so great question. Um, again, this is, you're, you're starting to see some of the theoretical nuance. Um, crime is normal, meaning of course it makes sense that some people will turn to it and some people will deviate and everyone will deviate at some point in their lives, will disagree with things, but if everyone does it all the time, and then you have no social structures other than maybe criminal ones. If people reject the government and start forming, you know, things like mafias and gangs, and those become bigger than legitimate opportunities, um, then he would see that as, you know, an extreme uh, kind, of, kind of turn away from normality. That would be the new normal. So then you would have a deviant society. If everything, you know, if everything was, that's, the argu that's part of the argument for legalizing things like marijuana. Um, or at least decriminalizing certain drug use um, in that, you know, if you label something as illegal, black markets will spurn uh, and start to grow, and then those black markets might come to over overtake the legitimate market. Um, so, you know, people might say, I'm not going to go to this stupid university and take these courses I don't like anymore. Hopefully not this. But um, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to become a drug dealer because there's this whole black market for me. Um, and then I don't have to get educated. I don't have to, like, be, you know, impress my parents. I can just go there and do this. So, anyway. Um, okay, so how did Durkheim come to see this way? So, again, uh, see things this way. Um, this is why it's useful to kind of put people in their context. Again, he was someone um, both very happy that, it, you know, the... the, um, the revolutionaries uh, in France of his day, again, about a hundred years before he wrote, um, he's very happy that people were embracing ideas of equality and liberty, um, but he thought that society was lagging behind. Um, there were still many social problems, um, and most, what he saw most pertinently um, around the world when looking at countries like France, so like Britain and like America, um, where people had been quote-unquote liberated, he saw this paradoxical trend that it also seemed that people were increasingly dissatisfied. Um, so it's almost like opening Pandora's box. You tell people, okay, now you can have it all. Um, you're no longer a feudal serf. You're no longer a peasant. Um, you are a citizen. Um, for people, as we'll see throughout the course, uh, for people that are given legitimate opportunities and educations to kind of pull themselves up, that can be very good. Um, but this process for individuals that are um, disenfranchised for a variety of reasons, um, economic, family-based, peer-based, location-based, um, they can kind of be torn between two worlds, where they're told that they can have whatever they want and work towards it, um, but then on the other hand, can't actually find means of doing so. Um, so Durkheim was the first person to really study this sort of push and pull of society on the individual. And being a very kind of polemical, meaning like argumentative um, and bombastic kind of person, he wanted to like make an explosion and form a new discipline. Again, sociology was not anything at this point. He was actually a philosopher, um, and that's who he was speaking to. Um, he said, you know what, I'm actually going to study the most seemingly individual, personal thing, and I'm going to show you that that's shaped by the outer world. Um, so he focused on suicide, and basically his argument in his mind, and that he wrote in his book, Suicide, um, initially was, if I can prove that this most innermost state, this thing that is totally anti-society, totally that seems it has nothing to do with other people, it's my choice to end my life, um, which at the time would be completely sacrilegious from like pretty much any religion, unless you're doing it for altruistic purposes, as we'll see. Um, but even then, very gray. Um, but if I can prove that that thing is actually social, then we can prove that all these other things, like people's motivation to do other smaller crimes, people's motivation to you know, become radicals or whatever, that those are not just idiosyncratic things in me, um, in a Lombrosian positivist way. They're not my genes, um, but they're a product of the environment. 
Um, so looking at what this led him to see, um, I'll ask you the question a little bit, it led him to see one kind of variable as totally key um, for looking at crime and deviance. Again, here, suicide is an extreme form of deviance. Um, so on the one hand, I just categorize it in two ways. He has four types of suicide that he usually talks about, um, but two of which are more kind of, um, you know, the kind of two extremes. So in societies like France and Britain and America, the ones, the kind of new Western democracies, uh, or newly democratized um, Western states, he saw that the rejection of kings and queens and lords and all of that, the rejection of caste systems, so it's not who you are, it's not who you're born into, it's what you do. Um, all that mentality we have now with the American dream. See you next week. Um, but he said in societies like that, people are literally left to their own devices, um, their own devices in many senses, so their own cognitive faculties, their own families, their own um, neighborhoods, they're left to themselves to make it in the world and to have beliefs and values. So imagine a context where you, know, you had a society that was highly top-down, very authoritarian, and your roles were preordained for you. You are a peasant, you will rent land from this lord, you will you know, be part of this religion, you'll be straight, you'll be all these things, you'll have these kids. No one usually is saying all of those things in that way, but, but that's just the tradition you're in. Now imagine revolutions happen, and you're in this new society, like today, just fast forward 200 years, where it's like, um, I don't know what I am, and am I gonna be like a professor, or a YouTuber, or a gamer, or like a drug dealer, or whatever? There's just so many options for all of us. So, so he says in this sort of situation, so in his time it was more like, okay, do I move to a factory? Do I become a farmer? Do I stay a bachelor? All these options were starting to open. And he said people may fall into two lines. So if you're looking at that sort, so we can just call it like number one, you could either be egoistic, so we can see these as like kinds of deviants, or you could be anomic. So it depends on kind of what else is going on in your society. So if you're a person that's now liberated and you're told you can have it all, but you end up not having it all, you end up messing up your decisions for better or worse, you know, you internalize it, so I'm not, I'm not judging people, he's not judging people, but he's saying from an individual perspective, you know, you feel you wasted opportunities, you weren't given opportunities, whatever, you may, um, so this is more about, you know, personal kind of ambition. If, if you do not feel you're able to get um, this, kind, this sort of liberty, or in, let's say, think of our current context of like being famous, being rich, being successful, being liked, any of those cultural values, um, you may have your own kind of sense of personal ambition hurt, and that, to Durkheim, may lead you more likely to kill yourself. Um, and again, not, it's called egoistic, so it makes it sound like you're some egomaniac or something, but it's not necessarily that. It's more that you've been deflated and you feel like a failure. On the other hand, anomic is not fitting in. So his state of anime, and that's the most important one, we'll see that carried throughout the course. Um, and it resonates the most with deviance. Um, so the reason why people, if you think of joining little cliques, joining a cult, moving away somewhere, joining a new club, you know, dyeing your hair, reinventing yourself, getting to, whatever it is, that's often because of what Durkheim would say, um, none of the norms, it's like none of the norms are truly guiding you, I would say. So I mean, this is my interpretation of it, but um, none of them are guiding you. So it's a state of normlessness. So the paradox here, though, is when someone feels normless, it's usually because they're in a society with a ton of norms and a ton of values. So think of today. You can be whatever you want, but I know from talking with students for multiple years as a TA and then a grad student, the most common thing is that people are frustrated that they don't know what to do. 
They don't know where to go. They don't know what to make of themselves. It can start with things like not knowing what to major. Then it can be like, what kind of person do I date? What kind of clothes do I wear? It's just endless, endless questions. So if you think of a highly constrained past, very traditional, um, these are relatively new questions in the human condition. Um, again, when people were in more tribal societies, small-scale societies, top-down societies, ones with more in, you know, powerful states, people don't find themselves in, in between the holes of, of norms. Um, so the video will clarify this. But anyway, so these are the two most important um, because they're the two that are the most pertinent, not to be Western biased or Eurocentric or anything, um, but just in terms of crime and deviance, these are the two that people talk about the most um, in North American society, where we're focused on, because the course is so short. Um, but then we also have, and he has other ones but, that are minimal, but then he, the other main one he has is altruistic. Um, and we'll see fatalistic. But that's not really talked about that much. Um, so these are in societies, again, and we'll see this in the video and in Merton next week, so you know, things are a little bit jumbled up. Um, but in societies where the cultural goals are, you know, you've been liberated, you can do whatever you want, people, and not just when they're committing suicide, this is an important point, he makes these for suicide, but you can think of any sort of deviance. Again, I always, I want everyone to always relate these things um, to their own lives and just think, you know, when have I felt like a failure or deflated or someone I know, um, you know, story of a criminal, story of whatever, deviant, quote unquote, when do I think that applies? When do I think it's a case of someone feeling depressed? If you put them in, in um, psychological terms, it could be angry versus depressed. Um, and I think, again, that's part of why these still resonate. Um, conversely, in societies that more privilege collectivism, so again, people being very integrated, um, so stereotypically Eastern countries, um, India, China, places with uh, caste systems, um, or uh, more you know, fixed government structures and law and legal policies, um, the tendency here, if people become upset with society or their laws, um, could be that they sacrifice themselves, so their, their life, their most intimate thing, for quote-unquote altruistic purposes, meaning for the benefit of society, um, or they do it for fatalistic reasons, meaning it's kind of like egoism here and anime here, except not quite, that's why I'm, I'm drawing messy arrows, but they're a little bit different, but altruism would be, you know, a saint killing her or himself for the good of the nation, um, a, a leader sack, taking a bullet for someone. Um, it's usually positive, um, but it could also be negative. It could be, you know, I don't really know how I fit into this big constraining society. Um, so it's altruistic if the person feels, okay, I'm giving myself up for the nation, and I want to do that, um, but it could be fatalistic if it says, you know, I can't actually have any impact on this society, I can't make my own choices, I don't really know who I am. Um, so it's starting to get like those ones, but again, think of someone here. Fatalism could be someone in a prison. So someone that's been in prison for like 40 years. Someone who is locked away in the attic by their parents. Um, so it doesn't have to necessarily be societal, it can be personal too. Um, the feeling of fatalism and futility in your own life means you just can't like do anything. You're totally constrained. Um, if you love your, your shackles, then it could be altruistic of saying, you know, maybe I don't have a lot of agency, but I shouldn't. Um, so Durkheim ultimately, we'll see in the video, um, in a few slides. Uh, so we'll just skip over that a little bit for now. Um, but the key thing of all of this and we're seeing, you know, he developed these categories primarily. Um, and with these categories, again, these were the, the product of him seeing that in these newly freed states and areas, people tended to commit suicide more often than they did pr prior to liberation um, because it kind of woke up these parts of them. And in societies that were too rigidly governed, um, he would see people killing themselves for altruistic or fatalistic reasons. Um, so the core of this argument, so importantly, is that societies that are either too little integrated, so where you're told one thing, but you either can't do it or you, or you don't really believe what you're being told. So if there's too little integration in the society, 
or if there's too much, then crime and deviance may be, to answer your question, dysfunctional. Um, so there may be something wrong with, and, and we'll see, he sees society as a body. So in a situation like this, it may be that people have lost faith in the education structure. So people are ritualistically getting degrees, and then that leads them to think, you know, why am I spending this money? Why am I going in debt? Why am I doing this? Conversely, in that sort of society, it may be people ritualistically going to school, um, but saying, you know, the state is telling me to do this, and it's super important, but I don't believe why this is important, or I don't believe why I can't be doing something else. So too much control, too little control, ultimately, same process. So we'll see, so to, to understand this process further, um, so going from point A to point B, again, he, looking at France and America, um, he and Britain, again, all the common legacy, aside from being European in base, um, in, in col you know, their colonies, I mean, um, post-colonial societies and, co and colonial societies, um, aside from that commonality, they all had in common, again, a big refutation of nobility and right by heredity, again, meaning you're born in a class, you become this. Um, so this kind of state that people were liberated from, he calls mechanical solidarity, and the kind of liberated state is organic solidarity. I mean, this applies globally too. It doesn't have to be revolution and liberty the way I'm framing it, but basically we'll see societies that he says are mechanical in terms of their solidarity um, are very tight in terms of the institutions that they have. Um, they have very few kind of norms and laws, but the ones that they have are very strict and very clear. You can't really argue against them. Uh, whereas in an organic society, um, we have so many different institutions developed, so many different ways to be a civilian, a citizen, um, that even though these things have an organic interdependence, we need them, um, we don't necessarily know that or see that. Um, so, for example, if you were born, you know, 200 years ago, you may see the education system as very, very linked to um, social class and the labor market um, because it was very small and they would just have like vocational programs that lead you to certain jobs and it would be certain kind of people that would take them. Um, whereas now, the education system has grown into something huge, and we know that, that, many, that there are you know, people that stay unemployed, or like, they're overeducated, underemployed. We don't see these things as, as functionally as related in the past. Um, and even companies like Google are starting to hire people without degrees to kind of prove that, you know, like, what's a degree in coding really give you? Um, I can test your coding ability um, by giving you, you know, tests. Why do you need to go to school for that? Um, so this difference, again, here we see he categorizes these two societies, um, and he sees this as an evolution. So again, societies start out, rel and, and these, you know, when I was an undergrad learning these, these concepts, I always found it a bit, as many people do, a bit counterintuitive, um, that organic is kind of the uh, more evolved one, because you would think maybe something starts organic and then becomes, like, mechanical through factories and stuff. Um, but the reason it starts this way is that in, a mecha in mechanical solidarity, people don't need to know that all of these norms and values are connected in some way. Because there's so few of them and they're so constraining, they just are what they are. So it's a mechanical process. So society here is its labor market, its religious system, and its education system if it has a formal one. Um, they exist and you follow them. You don't need to get in a self-narration of how they connect um, because you are pretty much ordained to, in life to go a certain path. Now, in organic societies, however, um, as, as we'll see, these institutions have been opened up. So we have, again, college, we have university, we have high school, we have elementary school, um, and it's up to us to see how these things connect. So for myself, when I dropped out of high school, I did not see the connection between the education structure and the labor market. Or I did, but I didn't see myself there. I saw that for, you know, losers that didn't play video games or whatever. I saw the labor market as video games, and I saw that you don't need education for that. Obviously now, being in school consecutively for 12 years, I've changed my mind. Although now I don't know what kind of job I'm going to have, so I'm having that disconnect again for another reason as a third life crisis. But, um, <laughs> the point is, 
I would not be having this conversation 200 years ago if my lot was, okay, you're either like a farmer or you try to become a lawyer or something. Like very, very um, preordained and you know, I, would, I could have wishful thoughts of moving up to politics or something, but not like now where I can have all these uh, fancy discussions with myself. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I kind of have um, struggled to understand the differences between altruistic suicide and anonymous suicide because altruistic suicide, um, from the um, um, the reading that uh, we were um, assigned to read, it said occurs when the individual is over integrated into the group, which sounds like mechanical solidarity. Mm -hmm. It usually is, yeah. Okay, so it's kind of like um, altruistic. Altruistic suicide is like, I'm just like anyone else, what's the point of existing kind of thing? No, that would more be fatalistic. So altruistic is usually a positive suicide. It's the one suicide that's positive. So it's someone who thinks they're being a martyr by killing themselves. So um, let's say it's a, a situation of that would be, let's say you're a prisoner of war and they're going to, and, and the people that took you. So let's say I'm America and I'm fighting Vietnam or whatever, I'm Vietnamese fighting America, whatever it is, think of the Vietnam War, and one soldier's captured, altruistic suicide could be when they're trying to get information from me, um, or I know that they're going to capture me and do that, I can kill myself for the good of the nation, um, so I don't give away my trade secrets. So Durkheim pathologizes that by saying like, whoa, like what state are we in when we are actually valuing society, which is just like a structure more than our own life. Um, but altruistic, yeah, so that's a, a great question. Anomic is like depression. Altruistic could be like um, infatuation or just like total protection. You're viewing society as like your child or your family or something. Um, yeah. So, and great parallel though. Those two are more like, he's, they're more, much more likely in mechanical solidarity when people, like this is, this is just how it is. It's a machine. Um, it's not a bunch of strange organs that I'm personalizing and stuff. Um, so these are much more, again, um, not to be, you know, making the past seem simple, um, but these are ones that are more seen as like ailments of the modern condition. Uh, so when people have more money, when they have more time, when they have more whatever, um, versus smaller, simpler life. Like think of even in the West, think of like farm life there versus uh, urban life. So egotistic and anomic are organic solidarity and rest. Yeah, exactly. There, there can be exceptions, but it, that's mostly the time. So for example, you could be part of a cult in 2019 Toronto, and then you could um, kill yourself altruistically, saying that you know, you, if you did a mass suicide, so something like the mass suicide movements that were happening throughout the 20th, think of the Manson family and all these things, um, the Manson murders, uh, you could convince yourself that actually you should kill yourself for the good of humankind, um, or you could feel totally trapped Let's say, if, again, you have an abusive family, one of those people that's locked in an attic, those horror stories you hear, um, you, could, you could still have those feelings. But you're right, on a societal level, yes, those are more mechanical and this is more um, organic. Um, so mechanical solidarity, again, typically, and again, in this course, we're not judging or labeling things, we're just trying to see how the sociologists have classified them. Um, so mechanical solidarity is typical, typically present in pre-industrial countries. Um, so again, think of all, again, I'm just using the, the Western examples of North America, Britain, France. Think of before um, the separation of rural and urban uh, was, was like a major thing. Think of before factories. Um, so people were more settled. Um, simple relationships and societies were the key thing here. Again, you're born a certain rank and you live that way. Uh, very kind of preordained. All encompassing norms and values. So you're born in a class, you respect your elders, you go to church, you do whatever. You can deviate. Again, I'm not romanticizing people back then. They very much disobeyed, with thing, uh, disobeyed rules and orders. Um, but there was simply less uh, for them to do when they were deviating. It was much harder um, because they didn't have the technologies we do now. They couldn't go and fly somewhere else. They couldn't take out big loans um, you know, through credit cards and like, move away and, and, and do all of these things. So there was just less ways for them to deviate. Um, so all encompassing norms and values, again, means there's, there's less norms. There's, there's not a whole bunch of like, counter movements and, and insurgents. 
Obviously, there were when the revolutions happened, um, but those were epochal. So for generations, uh, most people would be following those norms and laws. This leads to the key differentiator between mechanical and organic solidarities, or pre-modern and modern ones, which is the collective conscience, um, which I asked you about on kind of class one. Um, remember, so the collective conscience is, uh, you know, when we, when we talk about common sense, and why I said it's very important to keep common sense in mind, uh, think of your like automatic reactions to things. Though that, those automatic views, Durkheim says, are not coming from just you as you know, independent, snowflake, whatever, although you can be that, but it's coming from um, the collective conscience, which is the, the group's way of understanding something. So the collective conscience here, if we're seeing the norms as so tight and like few, do you think that collective conscience would be stronger or weaker? Again, it's kind of the group's way of looking at things. Would it be stronger? Show of hands? Yes. Okay. Um, so why would it be stronger? Again, it's like the collective, think of I have my own consciousness. I'm Lawrence and I'm this tormented gamer or whatever, I'm all these things. Um, the group one is what the society around me. So in a, in a has um, about a topic. So let's say about education, about rape, about murder, about incest, whatever the topic. I'm thinking of deviant ones on purpose. Um, the collective conscience, why would it be? Yeah. Um, I was going to say, is it something to do with that contingent theory, contagion theory? Like the high mindedness and like how every, when every, everyone's collectively acting in a collective kind of manner, it's powerful. Yeah, well, and also, so that, and then there's also, there's simply other competing, there's less competing norms. Um, so the collective conscience tends to be stronger because it's more united around topics because there are less dissenting opinions. Um, so that's always the fear in politics, right? That people will, there'll be mob rule and people won't really think about different positions. Um, that's why in university, you know, critical thinking is seeing things from multiple sides. Um, so in these sorts of societies, the stereotype of small towns is kind of, you know, everyone knows one another, they all think the same, they have, the, you know, they, they deviantize the same sorts of acts. Um, so the collective conscience here is really strong and it coerces people, um, it's coerced into people. So again, through socialization, which you would have learned in, in your intro classes, um, children are taught by education, you know, the media, um, and parents kind of what to believe and what kind of people to become. So again, in mechanical solidarity, simpler society, less norms, but then paradoxically the norms you have are much stronger. Um, and we'll just end off with this and then show the video and then have the break. Um, so in modern societies, however, individualism, and again, I'm not, you know, there's, there's a whole debate about whether individualism as we know it is a, is a contemporary thing. I don't believe it is. We've always been individuals. Um, you know, part of the problem of studying history is we only study written documents. Um, I find it hard to believe that people were not as complex and interesting or whatever, um, or boring as we are now. Um, but individualism as like a state thing, again, shifting off feudalism and right by birth and saying you're yourself and you can do what you want, kind of the, so the institution of individualism, that then led to major social problems for people because for, again, not the first time in history, but for like the biggest, like most salient uh, time in history, now people could see that they had two selves. So if you think of yourself all cozy with your family or whatever, and you think, you know, or your friends, and oh, we all get along, we all think the same things. Um, if your whole life is like that, and again, I don't think anyone's life's ever like that, but if that's the bulk of your life, um, you may think you have a very coherent self. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm like my friends, I, I'm with people I like, my family's good. Think of like, I always think of a very happy like little child who's just, you know, I'm one with the world and the environment. Um, then when you get older and you start to question things, you realize, oh, so there's, there's Lawrence that's like socialized by my community. There's me that, okay, I'm gonna listen to people, I'm well behaved. But then there's this part of me that's somehow unintegrated. I want to deviate and I don't know where that's coming from. Um, anytime you're frustrated with things, anytime you just don't, you know, it's not quite, anytime you, you really disagree with something. Durkheim would say, again, so this moment in history, people always did that. You know, little kids would be called brats or rascals or whatever for, for disobeying. Um, but this was the first time in history where this really became like a lifelong problem 
uh, for, for tons of people, not just rascals that grew up as rascals or whatever, um, as they would be seen in the past, but now this was like a contemporary problem of people who seemed very integrated and socialized. Um, so, you know, there's tons of examples of, um, you know, uh, housewives at the time writing letters, feeling totally frustrated with society, obviously for being like socially excluded, but, um, but many, many women, many, many men writing big, passionate letters, um, just feeling, you know, as what Durkheim would say, anomic or egoistic. Um, if you write, if you read letters of politicians and things, these grand ambitions that go unmet. Um, so Durkheim basically says pers people now are really seen for the first time as having two selves, the social self, the biological self, or the socialized self and the unsocialized self. Um, and this is why, so now hopefully it should all come together, this is why he was critical of revolutions. Not because he, he was upset that people were you know, now given more equality and liberty, but that we unleashed this part of ourselves. And it was just kind of done like the flip of a switch. It was, okay, you lived this very controlled life. You were, for better or worse, cozy with your environment. Maybe you were being abused, but you didn't realize it. You were just kind of going with the flow. And now we've opened the floodgates. You can be whoever you want. You can do whatever you want. But we were already socialized to be one with our environment. So now we've gone from, again, subjectively, um, just kind of not thinking about things so much, being more conformist, to now being like, oh, actually your previous way of life was very oppressive, you were treated like a peasant, you're actually equal to them, we killed the king, uh, he wasn't the king, he was just a stooge or whatever, and now you can go and become the president. So this is very liberating, but at the same time, opens up this new part of the personality, which can be, as he says here, or I wrote, um, can run amok, meaning can go unchecked, um, and can, if everything works out well, we'll see this in the video, if everything works out well, this can be great. You know, oh, my, my parents told me I can be whatever I want, and then I worked hard, and I became an actor, or I became a CEO, or whatever. But for people that don't have that sort of structure, or who don't luck out in that way, it can be, oh, I was told I can have whatever I want, but that didn't work, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do, and I kind of wish I had a more structured life. Um, so this fits into the, the, the dilemma of organic solidarity. So you're in a state where what he calls the moral order. Again, mechanical solidarities were mechanical, mechanically solid states were usually highly religious. Um, and so again, he's not anti-religion or pro-religion or anything. He's an atheist, but he, he is pro-religion in the sense that he sees people were more integrated. Again, they didn't have as many of these existential doubts and feelings of personal conflict because they were following orders. People like to follow orders a lot of the time. They like structure. Think of how hard it is to get things done when you have no structure, right? You tell yourself, oh, I'm going to do so much work or I'm going to like go to the gym or whatever and then you watching Netflix for 12 hours. It's very hard with no structure. Uh, it's always that like right amount that people want. Think of what relationships are, right? Um, even if you go to like biological theories of people controlling one another's mating patterns, um, but it, it can be that, but it can also be then, you know, having stability, having a rock, having, not having to let go and meet new people all the time. So that's what he's really tapping into. Um, but so this, so he says the, the recession of the moral order. So now that we don't have a simple explanation for why things are what they are. So again, you could think 200 years ago, why are the institutions the way they were? Oh, because that's how God wanted it. Well, that's easy. You can just say everything is how it is. Now that, now things need to be rationalized. So people, the, the, the role of the state and the role of the parent is to tell people and convince them at a deep level, not just like indoctrinate, um, and you know, this is something we all go through, but to see things as functionally interdependent. So it's not just that I'm telling you to disobey me. It's not just that I'm telling you not to commit crime. It's not just that I'm telling you to go to school. But if you don't go to school, you won't get a job. Or, or you will get a job, but not the kind of job you want. Um, and you, you know, you're, you're not, your parents aren't going to tell you, yes, you're raised in neoliberal individualism and we value high pay or whatever, but it will be okay, Johnny or whatever, you probably want nice clothes, a car, you know, to be around people and have, have you know, money to buy things. In order to do that, in our society, you have to go to school and take these sorts of programs um, and then get this sort of career and you'll find these meaningful, and you can have a family, and you can do all of these things. 
Um, so all of these things continually have to be convinced to people. So they were automatic before, you wouldn't think about it, but now that the kind of the meta level, so overarching, the, the, the big explanation has been taken away. So before, in a time of doubt, you could pray, you could ask God, or you could talk to the, you could think of the political leader and say, well, the leader told me to do this. Now, leadership's gone, and it's up to you to see, okay, how are these things actually fitting together? Um, and that's how people become anomic and egoistic when they don't see those things as fitting together. Um, so the, so the, the fundamental problem, again, I think you see too much control in those societies where you're like, okay, you're telling me this is all I can believe, then here, I don't believe in anything. I don't know what I'm doing. Should I be a Buddhist, an atheist? Should I be a cult member? Should I be a workaholic? Should I be a gamer? Um, and so all of these things, uh, again, same kind of process of someone feeling this missing variable that of Durkheim saying behind all of this is social integration. So in both situations, you either have too little or you have too much. Now, as we'll see, this is not total nihilism and we're in the organic mode right now. As I said, people can create their own mechanical pockets, right? So if you say, you know, I'm a family man, I'm a religious person, I'm whatever, that's your way of structuring your own life. Um, I'm devoted to my career, I'm interested in this. You can, you can structure your own life so you're not like that, obviously. Um, but, but that's still up to you. Um, so I'll show a video. I know the time's going, but we'll, I just have to finish this off. So again, the, you will see a video and all of this will come into person. So think here, anime, you have limitless desires. So the floodgate's been opened. I can now be the queen of England. I can do whatever the hell I want, but <laughs> um, I don't know where my beliefs are. So quote, with the decline in influence of religious beliefs, Durkheim saw it as imperative that governments intervened in economic and social life in order to establish suitable institutional arrangements and processes of socialization conducive to the creation of social cohesion. So what did that mean? This, mean, this means that those structures that we cast away, the church, we made the state weaker, those served a function. And now people are kind of left to their own, told they can do whatever they want, but not given the support. So I'm just going to show it was a short video, seven minutes, you can, and then you can think about it during the break, and then we'll discuss it. I think it's here. He was born in 1858 in the little French town of Ipinal near the German border. Before he was 40, Durkheim was appointed to a powerful and prestigious position as a professor at the Sorbonne in Paris. Durkheim lived through the immense rapid transformation of France from a largely traditional agricultural society to an urban industrial economy. He perceived his country was getting richer, that capitalism was extraordinarily productive, and in certain ways that it was also liberating. But what particularly struck him and became the focus of his entire scholarly career was that the economic system was doing something very peculiar to people's minds. It was, quite literally, driving them to suicide in ever increasing numbers. This was the immense insight unveiled in Durkheim's most important work, Suicide, published in 1897. The book chronicled a remarkable and tragic discovery that suicide rates seemed to shoot up once a nation has become industrialized and consumer capitalism takes hold. Durkheim observed that the suicide rate in Britain of his day was double that of Italy, but in even richer and more advanced Denmark, it was four times higher than in the UK. Durkheim's focus on suicide was intended to shed light on a more general level of unhappiness and despair in society. Suicide was the horrific tip of the iceberg of mental distress created by modern capitalism. Across his career, Durkheim tried to explain why people had become so unhappy in modern societies, and he isolated five crucial factors. In traditional societies, people's identities are closely tied to belonging to a clan or a class. Few choices are involved. A person might be a baker, a Lutheran, or marry to their second cousin without ever having made any self-conscious decisions for themselves. 
They could just step into a place created for them by their family and the existing fabric of society. But under modern capitalism, it's the individual that now begins to choose everything, what job to take, what religion to follow, who to marry, and where to belong. If things go well, the individual takes all the credit, but if things go badly, the individual is in a crueler place than ever before, for it surely means that there is no one else to blame but they themselves. Failure becomes a terrible judgment upon the individual. This is the particular burden of life in modern capitalism. Capitalism raises hopes. Everyone with effort can become the boss. Advertising soaks ambition by showing us limitless luxury that we could, if we play our cards right, secure very soon. The opportunities are said to be enormous, but so too are the possibilities for disappointment. In modern capitalism, envy grows rife. It's easy to become deeply dissatisfied with one's lot, not because it's objectively awful, but because of tormenting thoughts about all that is almost but not quite within reach. The cheery, boosterish side of capitalism attracted Durkheim's particular annoyance. In his view, modern society struggles to admit that life just is often quite painful and sad. Our tendencies to grief and sorrow are made to look like signs of failure, rather than, as should be the case, a fair response to the arduous facts of the human condition. One of the complaints against traditional societies, strongly voiced in romantic literature, is that people need more freedom. Rebellious types used to complain that there were far too many social norms, norms telling you what to wear, what you're supposed to do on Sunday afternoons, what parts of an arm is respectable for a woman to reveal. Capitalism followed the earlier efforts of romantic rebels as relentlessly undermined social norms. Countries have become more complex, more anonymous, and more diverse. People don't have so much in common with one another anymore. The collective answers to even very important questions like who should marry or how should bring up your children have become weaker and less specific. There's a lot of reliance on the phrase, whatever works for you, which sounds friendly, but it also means that society doesn't much care what you do and doesn't feel confident it has good answers to the big questions of your life. In upbeat moments, we like to think of ourselves as fully up to the task of reinventing life and working everything out for ourselves. But in reality, as Dirk and you, we're often simply too tired, too busy, too uncertain, and then there's nowhere to turn. Durkheim was himself an atheist, but he worried that religion had become implausible, just as its best science, its communal science, would have been most useful to prepare a frame social fabric. Despite its factual errors and its fantastical dimensions, Durkheim appreciated religion. He knew that the sense of community and consolation that religion offer are highly important to people. Capitalism has, as yet, offered nothing to replace this with. Science certainly doesn't offer the same opportunities for powerful, shared experiences. The periodic table might well possess transcendent beauty and be a marvel of intellectual elegance, but it can't draw a society together around it. In the 19th century, it had looked at certain moments as if the idea of the nation might grow so powerful and intense that it could take up the sense of belonging and shared devotion that had once been supplied by religion. Admittedly, there were some heroic moments, but they generally didn't work out very well. Family, too, seemed for a time to offer the experience of belonging that people seem to need. But today, although we do indeed invest hugely in our families, they're not as stable as we might hope. And by adulthood, children are hardly tied to their parents anymore. They don't expect to work alongside them. They don't expect their social circles to overlap. And they don't feel that their parents' honour is in their hands. Today, neither family nor the nation are well placed to take up the task of giving us a larger sense of belonging, of giving us the feeling that we're part of something more valuable than ourselves. Emil Durkheim was a master diagnostician of our ills. He shows us that modern economies put tremendous pressures on individuals and leave them dangerously bereft of authoritative guidance and communal solace. We are all Durkheim's heirs 
and somehow ahead of us the tasks that he grappled with. How we can create new ways of belonging. How we can take some of the pressure off individuals and find a more correct balance between freedom and solidarity. And how to generate ideologies that will allow us not to be so tough on ourselves for our failures and our setbacks. All right, so let's make, we'll take a 10 minute break um, and then we'll continue along those notes. Continue, so um, for your study buddy question today, um, I'll just hand out these cards as usual. Um, so I've spent an hour talking about how amazing Durkheim is, but now we're gonna see, so, and I, I said how he is like blending different positions and all of that. Um, you just pass one down. Um, if you now, I want you to think. So tyranny does call Durkheim um, a positivist. So why is he a positivist? And then that last part of the question is: If he is a positivist, is he the same kind of positivist as Lombroso? So what I want you to think through with this sort of question is, okay, let's assume Durkheim's a positivist. We probably don't think he's the same kind of positivist as Lombroso, because he's talking about social things, not genetic. Um, so what does tyranny mean when he calls him a positivist? And how's that different from Lombroso or someone? Um, so that's, that's the question. So let's just work on this for a few minutes. So after that, I just realized that like Dear Five is like such an existentialist. That I think that's one of the reasons I like don't like it. She's like a self-identified radical like like rights person, so I'm like good. Like yeah. good. So I highly recommended her, I helped her with her letter, and then yeah, she wrote. Yeah, she's very good. Ah, so I'm happy about that. All right. Um, so, according to Tierney, why is Durkheim a positivist? So any, anyone want to share their thoughts on why he's considered a positivist? Yep. I, I was going to say that um, he considered that organized um, society, or if um, society is working in um, equilibrium, he considered it healthy. But if a society is disorganized, he calls it pathological. So it's, um, it's basically a positivistic approach. And then also, um, one of the main principles of the um, functionalism is like society is like an organism. So it's kind of like scientific. And then also, he used um, um, methodologies that are really heavily influenced by uh, mm -hmm. positivism, which was um, really scientific. Yeah, so here I think, great, all of those are totally right. So when you think of the criticism of Durkheim, um, so jumping the gun a little bit, unlike Lombroso, where it was kind of the, the content of the, like, the specific things he was saying, you know, like saying racist things and, and very biologically reductionist things, um, for Durkheim it's more about the methods and the ultimate goals of, of sociology or criminology or the study of deviance. Um, so he's a positivist because, and even um, to address many of your questions earlier about the categories and like whether things fit in them, um, he really tr was trying to categorize and create typologies. Um, and at this time, he was doing this, not just whatever, to be a scientist or something, but he was trying to make sociology a real discipline. So at this time, it was not a discipline, and how do you make a discipline? Well, one way is to say, okay, we have a perspective that no one else is using, um, and we have categories and methodologies that borrow from natural science, but are now applied to the social domain. Uh, so sociology is, again, a social science, one of the first ones, and it's in that awkward position where it's like, you know, half, like, people are trying to be like natural, biological, physical scientists on the one hand, measuring things, doing surveys, objectifying things. But on the other hand, it's also like philosophy and literary studies where we realize there's also a lot of subjectivity and interpretation going on. Um, so Durkheim is often called a positivist because he was the first person to really try to formalize um, the study of society. 
All right. All right. Yep. I, I, well, I, I think another way that Dark Times is a positive base is because he's basically saying that like um, individualistic society is like destined to be too hopeful, and like when so, so, when control is taken away, from control of society is taken away, then most people will not know what to do and suffer for it. So it's basically. Like connecting how to Lombroso, how he emphasized how like things aren't in people's control because of inherent things. Durkheim's kind of saying that because of in a more social context, because kind of saying so once uh, once control of society is taken away, people won't know what to do regardless of their choices. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the only the only thing to just temper that a little bit, he's not saying everyone's gonna become anomic. He's just saying that can be so like very few people would be altruistic or fatalistic in this society, but it doesn't mean their problems went away because now they run the risk of becoming egoistic or anomic. So it's not, it's not necessary. Um, so his, so he does, he's, he does see it, sorry, as a social problem though. And he says, okay, in this sort of society, the risk that we've opened up is that people can become alone and isolated. And what he recommends in the division of labor, his kind of first big work, um, is just having what he calls workers associations. So ways that people, kind of like extracurricular clubs. Um, it's not like the biggest solution, but, but his big solution is, yeah, having basically clubs where people can be humans with one another. Um, but I agree with your point. He does, over, he does overemphasize that and think, okay, we can categorize societies based on their level of social structure, and those without are then more likely to be more egoistic and anomic. Um, and those are just categories he made up, and it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. So, I agree, but it's not everyone. He's not saying everyone in either case. He's just saying those are the risks. Um, but great. Um, okay, so ultimately for Durkheim and why I use him as kind of the central foundation of the more contemporary theories, or the central inspiration, is um, that he not only seems crime, sees crime as normal, as like, okay, we shouldn't judge it because it's people's signals of frustration to norms around them and values, um, or even misinterpreting norms and values, um, but that he sees it as necessary. Um, so it's inevitable, yes, there, people will do it, but it's also necessary. The reason for this is that it's adaptive, and that's kind of a tautology. So, but why is it adaptive? Well, how could new ideas ever emerge without deviance? Deviance, by definition, is going against the grain. If you are deviating from someone's expectations, what does that mean? It means, okay, I expect students, let's say in this classroom, to be totally happy with all of my essay instructions, the test instructions, the teaching, whatever. That would be good, but if everyone was really happy, like totally 100% all the time, then I would have no motivation to change. I wouldn't know what to change. I wouldn't even think to change. Um, now, obviously, if everyone was revolting against me, that wouldn't be very good. That would be like forced change. Um, that's why people tend to like constructive criticism, which is kind of, you know, helpful deviance of someone saying, you know, oh, I like the way you lecture, but maybe could you slow down? Or maybe could you have a picture here? Or maybe could you, you know, um, give more instructions on this or whatever? That then is helping me construct a structure that is amenable to people. Um, whereas if I'm like trolled and said like, worst prof ever, hate this, don't teach, whatever, that probably um, <laughs> would send me to um, egoistic or fatalistic. If I'm teaching all these courses, then I'm like, oh no, every student just hates me. Why am I doing this? Um, then that wouldn't be very good. Uh, but anyway, so deviance, if it's, uh, deviance is necessary in that, in that way, it's, it introduces, it forces kind of people to rethink what they're doing. Um, so uh, again, think of education. So think of people dropping out of school. Um, if no one dropped out of school, then flaws in the education system, such as it, you know, privileging students that are already doing well, things like streaming, um, maybe not having enough social work facilities, all of those things would not be developed if no one had problems with them. Um, so ironically, deviance has a positive function, basically, of again, if you're thinking of society as an organ, it's letting, or, or a, a body, it's letting the body know that something's wrong. Um, so, so people deviating is, it's like a pain adaptation. So yeah, it's letting people know something's wrong. Um, conversely, it also maintains boundaries. 
So if there's, uh, what, what does it do? So what, and what does this mean? So um, people dropping out of school, and I know this very personally from when I dropped out, dropping out of school, um, the reaction that people get. So if you think of normative reactions, um, so the reaction to someone robbing a bank, the reaction to think of something very heinous, like murdering a child. Um, and if, for me, the reaction of dropping out, um, people maintain the boundaries in social interactions. So if you murder someone, you indirectly are strengthening the taboo against murder. Because now, if you tell people that you murdered someone, that will make them emotionally feel, in most cases, or intellectually feel that you're a monster or you're awful. For me, when I dropped out, if I were to tell people that, then it would make people think, I think unconsciously, of, about how important school is and how much of a tragedy it was that I dropped out. So people would say, oh, but you're smart, why did you drop out? Or, you know, what's going on in your life? You, you need to go to school. Um, so breaking the norm actually strength, can strengthen it. Um, again, not if everyone revolts. So if every adolescent dropped out of school, that may then, you know, cause the school system to shatter or crumble. Um, but when people that seem potentially promising or something drop out, um, that strengthens the system and says, okay, we need to make sure that good students or whatever aren't dropping out or people aren't being left behind um, because this system's actually very important. So the, the example he gives here is public hangings and public executions. So people used to rally around to see people executed. Um, and in this way, it, it's almost like converting the deviance into a positive. Um, so for example, someone could kill someone's child. This is an awful thing, irremediable. But how can you find a silver lining for this? Well, publicly shame the person to let them know and let the community know, more importantly, not about them anymore. Yes, you're punishing them, but you're letting the community that we as a group do not tolerate this. Um, so even I think of myself when I... Um, <laughs> Not, I'm not being egotistical at all, I'm the least of this, but there's always, there's something I, I uh, again, after, after teaching the intro class and becoming more, whatever, TMI, um, than I used to be. Um, but I like this, I guess I should be, whatever, sort of proud of it. Um, I Google myself too much. But, um, but this is my little thing of that. So I was used as like whatever. So not used, I mean, I, I wanted to do this. It was a very big moment for me. So you see the timeline, so I wasn't lying. July 10th, 2009, 10 days before my birthday, July 20th. Um, I was turning 22. I started U of T when I was 22. So yeah, I don't even know my age, I'm turning 32. So um, adults returned to high school by the thousands. So just see, oops, um, my little photo. You know it's me because of how tall I am. You know what's shocking? She's actually six feet tall, but she always like demurs herself or whatever in the foot. That's my sister. Um, that's my sister and my, my grandparents. Um, anyway, so in that article, basically, they, it was, I was interviewed because um, I, I went from dropping out to then being uh, the school valedictorian and of, this, of, of an adult school. Um, and so anyway, that's just there, but... Um, that article, and they interviewed me about that um, because I was seen, I was showing people, you know, uh, and again, I was seen as this tragic case. I, had, I, I did a recording where I talked about my family life and all these things that I shouldn't be saying on recording, but anyway, um, I don't have the best relationship with my family, and so I, I was used, uh, again, I volunteered, sorry, not used, I volunteered as a case of kind of showing how people get lost from the education system. Um, and so my deviance was turned around for people of saying like, oh, wow, like people, if they, you know, use the institutions that are available to them, um, don't have to fall between the cracks. Um, so that was like a thing I was doing for a couple of years when I started university. I'd go back and I'd kind of give talks to struggling students and say like, I was very struggling. I failed grade nine twice. I had a lot going on at home. I could never focus. Um, and then I just tried to make this work. Um, and so in that sense, I, I think, I like to think <laughs> in, my, in my happier days when I was interested in, more interested in adult education um, and like changing that, I was seeing that, again, my case can actually work not to disrupt education, but to make it better and to make the boundary stronger. Because to me, education was what turned my life around. Um, so I worked, I used my deviance uh, to maintain and reinforce the moral authority of education, um, which as I said now, 
12 years <laughs> into being in school full time and having taught 25 courses, um, I'm having my, my new uh, dropout mode of being like, is this really what I should be doing? Why did I in reinforce this institution? I don't know if it works. But no, I'm not, not trying to give you existential crises about school. I know you're thinking about it enough. But I'm just saying that, you know, it's, I find it so funny. I sometimes listen to the recordings of myself and I was like, oh my gosh, I seem like I'm like, I'm like, yes, this is what you should do. It worked for me. And now I'm like, mm, I don't know. I don't know what I could have done. But, but anyway, you know, I think we're all like that. We change our minds about things. So I haven't turned on it, but I'm just saying it's not, not as simple as I presented there. Of like, oh yeah, I went back and um, that probably stopped after like five years. And then I was alternating between these things. <laughs> so, um, not, not about suicide though. No, no, not that extreme, but not usually that extreme, but more of, you know, of like, hmm. um, okay. So the, um, the Chicago school, so now we switch to this. So again, I think the message is pretty, um, it's very complex, but it's straightforward in the sense that ultimately social disorganization, and we'll see it with Bursic, is about how you can empower societies to, in a way, socially control their members, but in a positive way. So, so again, to prevent people like me or whoever you can think of from falling between the cracks and feeling upset. Um, so social control here, we'll see in Durkheim's sense, has a positive function. Remember that people were too free. They think they need freedom, but then they feel lost. Um, so the Chicago School maps on to this process as well, but mostly in the early 20th century. So a, few, a couple decades after Durkheim. Um, and here the argument remains consistent that increases in urbanization, again, so people moving from previous ways of life into these growing cities with, you know, uh, unlimited boundless, um, boundless ideals for people, we can make it rich, all this stuff. Um, they said they noticed that, as, as anyone noticed, um, that the negative consequence of urbanization were high levels of crime. Um, again, things like stores being looted, people being robbed, um, people being murdered, sexual assaults, all these things. Um, so what kind of the new sociologists of the time, again, sociology after Durkheim was like just being institutionalized in America, um, they used the methods at hand, which were surveys and like geographical maps and stuff to chart out kind of the areas of crime. Um, and so what, the, what here was, again, this was one of the first instantiations or instances of modern criminology. So this was an academic and kind of governmental attempt. So, you know, these institutions were funded by like rich philanthropists, but also by the state. Um, and they were lobbying for state funding. Um, and, and, the, and it had a goal, which was fixing the social problem of targeting and uncovering where crime, decay, debauchery, all these things are happening. Um, and again, it was focused on Chicago because this was supposed to be this big, great city that was now falling into decay, uh, but not everywhere in certain spots. Um, so the key theorist at this point was Robert Park. Um, so he was, he's a principal kind of founder of the Chicago School, and he builds right on Durkheim's um, organic metaphor. So again, of society being an organ and the, sorry, society being a body and the institutions being the organs. So if I have whatever, you have like, you have like, U of T is your heart, I'm sure, right? So <laughs> U of T, and then you have like, I don't know, uh, apple, oh, oops, that's your knee, you have a high knee, um, and then like, you know, your foot is like parents, whatever, so that's, that's the idea, that institutions are, are, uh, are organs in you, so, um, Robert Park saw society as this sort of body. So that's what I mean when I say institutions. So think, are all those things working? In the functionalist, organic solidarity, all those things are working together. Um, you know, if you, if you have a bad family, you may walk with a limp. Um, if you are against, like, smartphones and you can't communicate with anyone, then you may be hobbling. And if you don't like U of T, 
and you're a U of T student, you may have emotional pain and trauma. Um, so what Robert Park did, so he believes in the, in the organic metaphor, but he was part of a school that said, okay, we've been theorizing things and looking at things from far away for too long. We need to actually go out and study it. And we're in a great position because we're in Chicago where we have all these neighborhoods, some really rich, some really crime ridden. So we can actually go out and see what's going on. So we can put these theories in practice. We can see, are the people in the most crime ridden areas, are they engaging in crime because they're actually feeling egoistic or anomic or whatever terms we're, we're coming up with. We, so we can actually go and see that. Um, and again, the, the central argument that they thought was, okay, we probably will find something like that because um, we believe in what Durkheim was saying about societies forming organically. And basically the long and short of it is what they assumed was in neighborhoods where, peop where crime is high, it's because you have people that either are not connecting with the norms around them or are not given the opportunities to succeed. So it can be either cultural or structural. We'll see that key, key, key next week with Merton, because he actually talks about like cultural and structural affordances of crime and stuff, which sounds complicated, but it's not. It's really, think as a, as a human living in a neighborhood, um, are you told that you should live your life a certain way, and you don't, and, and, but then are you given opportunities to actually do that? So I'm told I'm supposed to be a law-abiding, wealthy citizen with wife and kids, whatever the norms are, but do I actually feel I can do that? So that's what they were trying to look at. And the, and the theory then is, well, crime will likely be higher in areas that have been, sociologically speaking, um, structurally neglected. So areas with, let's say, either very little policing or like hyper-police surveillance, areas full of racism, um, areas where people are moving in and out all the time, areas with no community centers, few jobs. Um, thinking of society as a body, it then makes sense that um, are areas where, you know, the organs are very deflated or dying or crippled for lack, you know, quote unquote, that's a pejorative word, but um, where they've literally been in a body sense like um, disabled, then it makes more sense to them that there would be more crime and deviance, people rejecting the body. Um, so the concentric zone model really helps us understand this. Um, I really like this model. It just helps us, I think, um, you can think of Toronto this way too, although modern cities now don't quite conform to this. So I just want to see if you're on the same wavelength. I'll, I'll just explain them and then I just want to see if you think there's one kind of thing that doesn't quite fit. Um, so think of this as, let's start with downtown Toronto. So you can think of zone one, um, the central business district, and you can think of this as like Bay Street. Um, if, you, if you were thinking of New York, you could think of Wall Street. So the central business district is where, not just where all the business happens, but where like the, the stereotypical high-end business happens. So it's the business capital. Um, so when you think of major metropolitan cities, it's like they're nice downtown where all the office workers are. Um, on the periphery of that though, is what's called, and you'll see it's highlighted in special color, ironically right around that area, or not ironically if you've been downtown, um, and, and, but, uh, or live downtown, but um, right outside of that is what's called the zone of transition. Um, so here you will have many lower wage occupations, so things like dry cleaners, convenience stores, restaurants, strip clubs. Um, you'll have basically things that service the office workers. Um, so you have like upper strata workers in the center and then the lowest strata center, of, uh, one of the lowest uh, strata of workers right outside of it. Um, it's called the zone of transition practically or the most pragmatically because um, it's a very transient area. Again, it's full of stores that are like frequented by people, but not where they really are supposed to hang out. So again, things where you would maybe buy groceries, things for work, um, uh, intermediary things. You can think of like Young Street now, if you think of like uh, between Young and Bloor and Young and Queen, um, it's all those kinds of stores. There's some gyms now and things, but that was a traditionally kind of zone two area um, where again, uh, you know, strip clubs and stuff, we'll get to that later, but those would obviously give rise to, to crime around them. Um, but the zone of transition, people don't really live there. So we'll see that's the key thing, they typically don't live there. 
um, and they don't stay there. In the primary zone, there's always people there working hard, lots of security. Um, not working hard, but I mean they're necessarily, but um, high paid. Um, then zone three, the zone of independent workers' homes. Um, so this would be if you just go a little bit outside of downtown and you go and you start looking at houses and apartments um, and communities that are developed around there. Um, so like around U of T St. George, if you get to like the Bathurst area um, and, and DuPont, just around it, a little bit of maybe, maybe even like Queen West. Um, this is, and then Leslieville and all those things outside of it. Um, then you have the zone of better, refer uh, better residences quite further. So then that would be if you went to um, Rosedale or even outside of the city now, because Toronto's much bigger, places like Oakville, um, things that basically they're the spots where people want to commute from. Um, so the people that live in zone one will commute from wealthy suburbs um, or suburbs within the city. Um, and then zone five is just the commuter zone. So Oakville necessarily not, might not necessarily be the zone of better residents. It might be R Rosedale because it's actually within the city limits, but the idea is the same. Um, and the commuter zone is just highways and all of that. Um, so the important one here, you don't need to know, you know, it, important to know the distinction of the five. Again, I think it's good to, to see them. Again, you have the central, you have where the business happens, you have the zone of transition where the, those people are basically being serviced and the people living there, um, We'll, as we'll see, uh, have certain, the, the odds of them committing crime are higher. Then we have the homes um, that independent workers have, and then we have the nicer homes. And it, it, it goes for, further out. And nicer, again, I don't mean judging, I mean stereotypically, uh, people f fleeing to suburbia to have big homes. Um, so zone two has the highest amount of crime, it says here, due to, and you'll see these theories are still kind of vague, due to people, quote unquote, passing down criminal ways to children and adolescents. So what does that mean? Oh wait, well, the key, we'll see this, I don't want to jump the gun too much, um, but with, with Bursic, we'll see exactly what that means. Essentially here, using social disorganization theory, just very quickly, why would it make sense that zone two would have the most crime? Think of the community, social, collective conscience aspect. Why do you think a neighborhood where people are occupying jobs that are low paid for people that are very wealthy and they're in very close proximity to that, but they're in a neighborhood where everyone's like moving around and uprooting themselves. People don't, the, the key thing here is people don't tend to settle down roots in these areas. Why do you think, according to social disorganization theorists, people like Durkheim, um, and Robert Park, why do you think more crime might happen there? Nope. There's like more heterogeneity and there's, more like, there's less moral unity. Exactly, yeah, so, so for Durkheim that's, that's definitely one explanation. Moral unity is very weak there. People don't know their neighbors, they don't know who will be there next year. There may be resentment against people that are um, within zone one also. Um, so as we'll see there, it said, when it said quote unquote criminal ways being passed down, um, it, it means there could be black market institutions, drug dealing, again, I, I brought up the, the idea of the strip club. Um, these are institutions that are designed really to like be luxuries for wealthy, the wealthy, for wealthy classes in the center of the city. Um, so for many sociological reasons, it makes sense um, that the business is setting up um, in this area, you know, they, they pay high rents, um, people move all the time, it's very competitive, and the people working these occupations often are relatively deprived. Um, so a community can't grow in the same way. We'll see now, you know, and I'm not, it's very important not to take this too, too literally in the sense of judging neighborhoods. Um, zone two in Toronto would very much, one example would be Regent Park. Uh, which has recently, you know, there's gentrification efforts, some of which are raising house prices, but others of which um, are really trying to revitalize a neighborhood that's been kind of structurally impoverished. Um, but so I think that the logic of the concentric zone model is very important, but when you think of any city, um, and again, using Toronto as an example, real estate in zone two is like super expensive. So that's actually like the most desirable real estate now, if you think of downtown. Um, and there have been major community building efforts in these areas too. Um, but, ironic, but it's also where uh, many homeless individuals are um, and uh, lots of crimes as well. So I think this is interesting. 
to put, again, put it in the context when it was written. Um, this was when, you know, think of Toronto first forming, you would have the nicer jobs in the center, and then the people being serviced there, and then those workers living outside, the richer wor workers living even further outside in Roseville or, Oak or Oakville, or whatever it was. Um, and then in this zone too, for, as a blanket term, uh, people that are relatively deprived or marginalized. Um, so the, the problem of this theory, as we'll see when it ends, this theory, um, it influences many theories that, that we'll discuss later, but it also has the unfortunate tendency of stigmatizing neighborhoods and populations as being, quote, criminogenic. Um, so, as I said, it's very difficult as, in life when, you're, when you want to do justice to the structure agency debate and say, okay, I can understand why there may be certain forms of crime and deviance in this neighborhood because of structural reasons. That's very different from saying, you know, I don't want to walk through this neighborhood because I'm going to be robbed. Um, which, unfortunately, in, in the case of Toronto, again, just growing up here, stereotypes about places like Jane and Finch, Regent Park, and then closer to here, like Melbourne. Um, people have ideas about these things, which some of the negative ones come from schools like this. Uh, no, not schools like U of T, but school, <laughs> schools like the, the, the Chicago School Theory. Um, so, things are always more complicated. Um, so lastly, just a couple of slides on this, because we'll be continuing this next week. Again, there is no one definition of social disorganization. It's more just um, putting some of those Durkheimian ideas in practice. Uh, so that's why I said for Bursic, uh, don't get too caught up in his article, because he's deeply involved in this and like giving all the pros and cons. His way of framing social disorganization and more the contemporary way of framing it is that Social disorganization exists in a place, in an environment, if individuals simply cannot control their members' behaviors. Um, so a socially disorganized neighborhood, again, is a place where, despite community members' desires, there's a lot of crime going on. So something like Zone 2. Again, think of if you're living in a zone of transition, and there are a lot of um, nightclubs, strip clubs. I'm not trying to pathologize those places, but they've been historically seen as like um, you know red light districts, not because of the sex work per se, but more that um, they're off. They've often been linked. The same people in charge of them have been linked to drug cartels and so on and so forth. Um, but if you're living in a neighborhood like that, it's often very hard to get um, the police involvement you want. Also, if you're a marginalized group, um, the relations with the police may be, may be tenuous as it is. Um, so here, social disorganization is literally, I can't organize my neighborhood to be normal. They're, ref they're, they're turning to deviance around me. Um, there's lootings, broken windows, and crimes, and so forth. Um, so I think he, he gives three, I'll end it on this, he gives three really nice reasons that, sh that I've been peppering in throughout. Um, but he states really clearly kind of why and how this happens. Um, so the number one reason is related to that collective consciousness idea. Um, these areas have very high population turnover, which makes the development of informal control norms hard to make. So again, if you have people moving in and out, it's hard to socialize people into whatever your status quo way of life is. Um, people will come into the city with different values and they'll use those. Um, it's very hard to control people when they think, okay, I'm just going to live here for a, for a month. I'm going to live here for a year. Um, they don't form community associations in the same way necessarily. Um, this makes the relationships weaker. Um, and as the student said, population heterogeneity makes this whole conversation both more difficult and more rare. Um, when people are thinking, okay, this is not where I want to live, this is the zone of transition, I want to live in zone three or zone four, again, no one would frame it that way. Um, but if they're, they're thinking, like, why am I going to plant down roots in an area that I'm only going to live for two years? Um, so areas right around university campuses could also be like this too. If you think, okay, I'm only going to be here for four years, why do I need to make friends? Um, that's part of why U of T St. George is seen as so isolating for students because so many of the students are commuters um, and then they don't form ties on campus because they think, well, what's the point of settling, laying foundations when I'm only here for four years? But then that feeds into the whole problem of then U of T students, particularly at St. George, feeling very anomic and, and egoistic sometimes when they're like, 
I'm getting into U of T, I'm going to have a prestigious degree, and then they start flunking courses or whatever the, the case is, um, and then not making friends. It's very, I'm not making fun of it. I've been, I've had heart to hearts with lots of students, and myself, when I went back to, to U of T St. George, it can be a very um, demoralizing situation for people. Um, so I rushed a little bit on the social disorganization at the end, only because all of next week continues that. Um, so this week was more about Durkheim, and we'll be going over those last couple of slides next week too. Um, so you have tutorials tomorrow, and the tutorials will be on essay prep. Um, so I prepared a handout for, for Jason and some slides, and basically we just want, now that we've introduced, we've only really introduced um, a couple theories so far, but we just want to start getting you thinking about what you want to write about. Um, so basically, you'll be brainstorming different criminal and or deviant behaviors or acts, so theft, getting face tattoos, whatever it is, and trying to explain it sequentially and then see what theories help me explain this. So again, just getting our appetites wet for um, using theories to explain crime and deviance. All right, so I keep running late, but if you have any questions, I will be just outside the class. Um, and just as a note, I'll make an announcement about it. Um, I'm going to be at a conference this Friday, so I don't have any office hours. Um, but we don't have any deadlines or anything, and no one's come yet, so <laughs> it should be... Just don't make this the one week you come, because no one's come yet. Um, but I, I'll have extra ones closer to the test date, and I'll definitely have them next week again. Um, so just unfortunately, again, um, none, none this Friday, because I'll be away all day. <laughs>